Hello, and a very warm welcome to all the people attending this webinar today on applications of AI in semiconductor design and understanding the lucrative career options in the same. To give you guys a bit of context, uh, at a time when the tech space is dealing with a huge chip shortage, uh, industry titans and many small scale companies have realized how vital the application of artificial intelligence is in the chip manufacturing process. Leading the undertaking is Intel, which is solving complex business problems in semiconductor space with AI and data science. As a matter of fact, Intel's AI center of excellence is at the forefront of this. To this end, Analytics India Magazine, in association with Intel, is bringing you an hour-long session to guide us how to accelerate the transformation of semiconductor design and manufacturing with the application of AI, machine learning, and data science. To lead this webinar, we have with us Mr. Gopalan. He is the head of AI Center of Excellence at Intel Corporation, where he has been responsible for developing the AI competency in the organization by in developing in-house AI talent, engaging with business units, and identifying opportunities where AI can accelerate product development and bring transformative impact. Along with him, we have esteemed panelists, Nufar Gaspar, the Director AI Everywhere Group in IT AI at Intel Israel, Armul, Ar Ar Arman Amitai, the Chief Data Scientist at Intel Israel, Tushar Sharma, Applied AI Research Scientist at Intel, Divya Shri, she's the Applied AI Research Scientist at Intel, Ms. Sakina, she's the Applied AI Research Scientist as well at Intel, and Ravi Shankar, he's a machine learning engineer at Intel. These speakers, who are the experts in their respective domains, will take us through interesting use cases to understand how AI will be available to recast semiconductor designing operation. So this session will also have a 10 minutes Q&A in the end. So please drop in your questions on the Q&A tab or on the chat box. And without any further delay, let's welcome our speakers to this session. Hi, all. Welcome to this webinar. And over to you, Mr. Gopalan. Thank you, Sajiti. And uh, once again, a warm welcome to all the participants and panelists for this uh, first ever uh, launch of uh, uh, webinar, focusing specifically on the AI capabilities um, that we are delivering within Intel. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so as as the first segment of our session, uh, I would like to invite uh, Nufar. Uh, she is the director of the AI Everywhere uh, program under which the AI Center of Excellence rolls in. And she will give a quick overview about IT's Artificial Intelligence Group. We are part of that group. She will give an overview and then uh, walk us through some of the specific um, functions in which you know we deliver AI capabilities. With that, I will turn it over to Nufar. I'll also quickly go ahead and share the points. Uh, no. Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the artificial intelligence group within Intel. It's one of the most mature uh, organizations um, in uh, large corporates, uh, in semiconductors and other industries. Uh, we've been around for over 12 years. Um, over 220 AI professionals worldwide, India, Israel, um, US, and Costa Rica. Um, the accumulative uh, value of our uh, uh, solution just last year was over $1.5 billion, either um, addition to the top row or reduction in the bottom row using very intrusive AI capabilities. We have over, over 500 such solutions in production with million, millions of inferences a day. Um, this is uh, all based on a very diverse set um, of, uh, business, of, uh, of business challenges, of data types, uh, as well as AI technologies, uh, some of uh, which Amitai will mention uh, uh, shortly. Um, can you click to the next one, uh, Gopal? In terms of the main areas uh, by which we operate, you can see uh, some of the list here. I'm not going to go into uh, each and every one, but 
Um, we are very focused on uh, uh, changes that are uh, unique and specific to the semiconductor industry, whether it's improving the product power and performance by introducing AI-based algorithms uh, into the product or improving the overall quality um, by uh, overtake, like uh, taking charge of the uh, testing procedures using AI, um, whether it's in pre-silicon or in uh, the high volume manufacturing where each and every uh, unit is being personalized. Um, as well as helping uh, the um, yield engineers and other other factory engineers uh, go about their work um, by uh, uh, producing yield-based um, AI analysis, uh, sorry, AI-based yield analysis, um, as well as helping the various uh, sellers of Intel identify unique sales opportunities and increasing the number of sales being done. Um, um, and last but not least, helping the business units uh, finding the um, right uh, optimization of supply and demand and other parameters that help uh, shape those. Um, you can click. Um, in terms of the roles in this team, and, and you'll probably hear uh, many of them uh, speaking in the panel later on, uh, mostly we have um, four different uh, parts with, for each uh, project team, a data scientist or AI applied research scientist uh, like this team. Um, we usually uh, work very closely with subject matter experts, acknowledging the importance of having someone that really is familiar with the business in order to do intrusive AI in production. Um, we have uh, product managers that are AI experts, knowing to uh, create products that are not only good uh, as a product, but also using uh, the right technology to the right extent. Um, and last but not least, the machine learning engineers, people that know how to build um, high-end software um, that enables uh, productization in a very cost-effective um, in and in, in also in a very uh, intrusive and integrative to the business process and you'll be hearing from most later on. Um, I want to wrap my part to discuss specifically about, you can click on, um, specifically about our unique program called AI Everywhere. Um, while this uh, group of AI experts uh, has been able to do a lot of AI within Intel, we are not the only one doing AI or motivated to do AI, but we do hold a lot of expertise. And what we've created within Intel is a unique program that helps others, whether they are individuals or groups trying to do AI, uh, to be more successful and extend a lot of the learnings and know-how to uh, those other teams. Um, this program, you can see the main components, it holds both self-service AI tools, as well as um, use cases delivery and consultation done by the AI Center of Excellence. Um, we uh, deliver many training sessions uh, for uh, individual contributors to managers and others, and we foster a very large community of AI practitioners and enthusiasts, over 4,000 uh, members, um, and so much more. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Gopalan, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Nufar. That was um, an excellent overview of uh, IT's Artificial Intelligence Group and the value that we are creating for Intel. So uh, coming to specifically talk about the AI Center of Excellence, which is uh, responsible for use case delivery, that is the core function. I'll talk about the additional areas where we contribute for the AI Everywhere uh, uh, initiative or mission, as you may call it. Uh, Specifically, if I have to talk about the uh, the AIs, uh, COEs uh, delivery, if you look at it, we predominantly focus on use case delivery, which is essentially engaging with various business units, identifying uh, business opportunities that can be solved using AI techniques. The, uh, as we get into the webinar and as we get into the panel discussion, uh, we will talk about uh, what each uh, of the panelists have been uh, tackling as uh, problems and the solutions in the respective business units that they have been working on. Uh, that is, I would say, as the you know, major contribution that is coming from the AI Center of Excellence. In addition, as Nufa mentioned, we also play a very key role in enabling uh, the self-service AI tools, which is essentially all about how do you, uh, you know, you have an end user who is fundamentally uh, probably doing his function in finance or in um, as a design engineer in a validation team or in a uh, design team, but they can also, you know, uh, 
start using some of these tools and then uh, develop or validate some of their ideas that whether you know whether these can be solved using ai techniques or not so that's why we call this consciously and self service ai tools as you know with these tools we enable our uh, internal customers essentially the design engineers the validation engineers the finance analysts and the and um, uh, anyone within the organization uh, can use these tools validate some of their ideas quickly do some proof of concept and then see whether their um, uh, idea is worthy enough to be solved using ai so this is one vector in which uh, we provide consulting help we actively explore some of the uh, you know uh, tools that are coming in the market and seeing how best we can proliferate these tools and enable and equip our end users so that they can you know uh, uh, validate some of their initial ideas and eventually work with the ai center of excellence uh, in uh, developing these ideas into implementable solutions and finally deploying them in in our production environment the other vector where ai coe plays a very active role is um, in fundamentally uh, uh, creating an ecosystem within intel right uh, because uh, ai mindset is very very different from a software mindset so to develop this ai mindset we offer uh, a lot of training within the within intel so that the ecosystem uh, starts thinking about uh, problems that can be solved using ai so this is one key enabling area in which we play a very active role in across the globe in working with our end users or ai champions so that um, uh, you know the uh, these uh, training courses are rolled out globally and the ecosystem starts when i say ecosystem it's essentially the the engineers uh, the design engineers the manufacturing engineers the marketing analysts and the finance analysts of intel right so that they start understanding and gain an appreciation for the problems that can be tackled using ai techniques the, so unless the ecosystem is developed you know you won't be able to harvest potential ai ideas and solve them right so we consciously as part of our strategy we invest uh, upfront on this ecosystem development and the fourth vector is the developing the ai communities which is all about it's sort of you know uh, apart from uh, training is more like a formal uh, way to impart knowledge but communities is all about you know where somebody has a has a great idea and someone also has um, uh, an idea of how to solve them we kind of bring these people together it's more like a platform where problem create you know uh, problems are identified and problems are also discussed and potential uh, ways to solve them are also discussed right so we run uh, mechanisms like ai office hours we run you know a lot of webinars and mini meetups so that uh, our uh end users within intel wherever they may be once they go through these courses we help them to apply their formal knowledge into their own backyard uh, uh, by looking at their own business problems and uh, evaluating whether they can be solved using ai techniques the communities come very handy here they help out each other you know somebody has a problem someone has an idea and then we they kind of brainstorm and figure out whether they can solve in addition we also you know the experts uh, whom you are going to interact today they also kind of provide their subject matter expertise from a data science perspective so that uh, these problems don't get stuck uh, just in the discussion stage they kind of mature quickly in the ai development life cycle and then eventually become implementable solutions so these are broadly the 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 four service vectors as uh, you know nufar mentioned these are the broad uh, you know service offerings of ai everywhere program and ai center of excellence as we you know as the name itself indicates is right in the center of all these services you know uh, that's the team you are going to interact with uh, today with that i will uh, pause here and then you know i'll take questions towards the end of the webinar right now i will hand it over to uh, amitai who is the chief data scientist of uh, our group with that um, uh, amitai i'll stop sharing thank you Bukhara. And uh, you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes uh, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, and Nufar Gopalan told you about the various uh, challenges that we have. 
making the machines in the factories smart, making the processors inside the computers smart, uh, making the factories uh, uh, themselves smart. And uh, these uh, applications require uh, harnessing the cutting edge innovations in AI uh, to uh, actually solve these problems and uh, get the best impact both for Intel's customers and for Intel itself. Uh, when we're talking about innovation, uh, so you probably heard about many of the recent innovations uh, in AI, like, ah, okay, sorry. I see, I, I see uh, the, uh, do, do you still see my presentation or is it? Uh, yeah, we see the file containing recent advances in AI applications. Ah, excellent, okay. Uh, so, uh, you can see here uh, five of the key adva uh, recent advances in AI applications. Uh, most of you probably heard about the advances in language models like GPT-3, learning all the text in the internet and being able to interact with people and compose text. Lots of progress in autonomous driving, uh, uh, being able to drive inside cities, not just in the highways. Uh, breakthroughs in predicting protein folding uh, and new uh, emerging involvements in machine programming and in uh, using AI for chip design. And many of these applications uh, relevant for Intel, of course, and our group uh, worked with Mobileye and we use the language models, the machine programming techniques, uh, chip design techniques. Uh, but actually the innovation in progress in AI has one deeper level. So behind those new AI applications that many of us hear about, there's a lot of innovation in AI techniques that enable those applications. So you can see here things like self-supervision and graph neural networks and attention transformers that enable some of the things that you had you saw in the, the previous slide. And these new techniques are also applicable for other use cases. And in our group, uh, we apply many of these uh, techniques, most of these techniques, uh, to our use cases. Uh, to uh, help solve the problems uh, that we have. I won't be able to go into all the details, I just want to focus on one uh, topic, and this topic is uh, coping with the scarcity of reliable labels. So, uh, you know, in the ideal modeling scenarios, we can use supervised learning based on label data sets. If we don't have label data sets, then we have lots of raw data that we can easily label. And we, if we have just few labels, then we can use pre-trained models that can be adapted to our own use cases using those few labels. But in reality, uh, it's often not the case. We don't have any of those ideal modeling scenarios because many use cases don't have label data and it may be very expensive to do the labeling and the data may be very imbalanced. So we don't have enough examples of all the classes to, bar to label them. And uh, the use cases may be very domain specific. So we cannot just use a pre-trained model from ImageNet and uh, train it to predict uh, things on our, uh, on our images from some uh, microscope in the factory or something which is related to uh, X-ray images and so on. Uh, so, uh, I'll give you an example of a problem and how we approach it. Uh, so, uh, one area in which Nufar mentioned that we are active is AI for solutions for sales. Intel sells to other companies, business to business. So, we crunch lots of data that we comes from sales, from websites of those companies that we sell to, from social media, from news sites that tell things about those companies. Uh, those companies are companies that usually build something, for example, build computers based on the processors that we sell them. We use lots of AI techniques to crunch this data, and I'll touch upon that later. And we provide two types of output. One of them is sales assist, telling uh, something that something interesting happened about that company, and that company should be, that customer should be contacted. And another one is recommendations, specific products uh, that should be sold uh, to that uh, uh, to that uh, customer. And uh, the actions based on these uh, uh, outputs uh, can either be based on uh, the, uh, can either be uh, taken by salespeople or by uh, bots. Uh, so uh, why do we have a problem of uh, data scarcity? It looks like we have lots of data. Uh, the issue is that if, for example, we're interested in identifying tweets uh, of new sites or our partners or customers, that would interest salespeople, it's like, just like looking for a needle in a haystack. 
how can you find among all the tweets on Twitter about uh, or specific companies something about product launch or partnership or merchant acquisition? And if we are interested to characterize our partners by interest on the website, we don't have any labels about what these companies are doing, what are their market segments or product types. If you look at the Intel website, for example, you can think that it does something in sports because it says that Intel is active in the Olympic Games, for example, right? So uh, when you don't have uh, labels, uh, you need to uh, take different approaches. And the approach that we took for this problem is a weak supervision approach. We used a, cool, a tool called Snorkel that was developed by the Stanford AI lab. And we collaborated with them and also later provide, uh, published a joint paper. And the idea in Snorkel is to use user-defined rules that are uh, defined by domain experts. They are not completely correct. They are just probabilistically correct. For example, in the uh, use case of identifying interesting tweets, maybe a tweet could interest me if it contains the word partners, but that doesn't interest me if it contains a how, it contains emojis, emojis, and I have other rules for defining an interesting tweet. And then these rules are uh, uh, translated into Python, and then I could just do the wisdom of the masses, uh, check whether according to the majority of the rules the tweet is interesting. But actually, I have the health phenomenon. There are correlations between these rules, right? Uh, so uh, I could be wrong if I just took the majority vote. And then I, we can cancel out those correlations based on applying the rules to all the tweets, get some probabilities for a tweet to be interesting, and then apply AI methods, deep learning methods, to try to predict those probabilities based on the data. The AI method is a generalization of uh, what the people are uh, defining based on the rules. And eventually, the answer here, the final model, was an ensemble of the user, the rules defined, uh, the, the model defined based on the rules uh, of humans and the models defined by uh, AI. So here, I don't have any labels uh, for the problem of finding tweets, interesting tweets. I just have some user-defined rules that are not exactly correct, and I'm able to uh, put a model in production that actually finds those interesting tweets. And I have a few examples that I can use just to check that it works uh, well. So this is just one example of how we can use uh, relatively new techniques to uh, solve the problem of data scarcity. And the first paper was in 2019, and we continued implementing this for other use cases. And you can read more about uh, what we did with this uh, weak supervision method uh, in the papers uh, that I uh, mentioned uh, here. Uh, of course, weak supervision uh, and self-supervision have additional use cases. And I'll briefly mention another one, uh, a vision use case, uh, use case in which we would like to validate the graphics processors that Intel provides. Uh, so Intel provides many graphics processors, both discrete and embedded. They, their software, the drivers, gets update, get updated all the time. And we would like to test visually that uh, random games, random actions in games, random, randomly playing videos, random ads, look OK on those, uh, on those uh, processors with those drivers. And you can see here with the red rectangles examples of corrupted images, which are quite uh, clear and uh, without the red rectangles, these images are fine, but they may resemble uh, the bad images. So initially we built a system which is based on, on label data, on supervised learning, labeling each and every frame by people who just did this labeling 30 frames per second for many examples of movies that had the uh, reproductions of those bugs. Uh, but uh, of course it's very tedious and if you have like Maybe a new type of problem that may happen, you need to, to add that, and, you know, it's, it's tedious work. And then later on, we found out that we can actually use a weak supervision approach. Instead of having a label for each frame, we can have a label for each minute or even for each video using a technique which is called multiple instance learning, in which we don't have the label for each instance, we just have the label for multiple instances, for a set of instances. And this gives a signal which could still be used to identify cases uh, that actually have a, a problem. And if we have enough instances, we don't even need to label anything. We just need to know that this movie 
uh, has these, these problems. So it's not as good as supervised learning, but assuming we have enough cases, enough examples of this bug, which will catch some of them without uh, doing the labeling at all. So uh, the, the gap, the, the difference between uh, labeling each frame a lot of 30 frames per second for, for long movies and not doing any labeling at all is huge and it, it still provides uh, interesting results. And you can read more about that uh, in our papers in Europe's, work, Europe's workshops and also last year in the uh, ACM uh, KDD conference. So this was just a brief overview about a couple of our use cases. As Nufar mentioned, we have hundreds of models in production, lots of use cases. You can read about some additional use cases in the IT and Inter website. And uh, with this, I will uh, thank you and uh, move back to Gopalan. Thank you, Gopalan. Thank you very much, uh, Amitai. That was a very insightful uh, review of the complexity and the value we generate uh, using AI techniques. Um, so with that, uh, we will now move into the next segment, which is uh, the panel discussion. So we have Tushar, Sakina, uh, Divya, and Ravi from the AI Center of Excellence uh, team. So maybe we'll start with uh, Tushar first. Uh, hi, Tushar, how are you doing? Hey, hi, Kupalan, I'm good. I hope everyone is good. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we got off to a great start. Um, with an excellent overview of IT AI group from Nufar. And then um, Amitai took us really deep uh, into some of the cutting edge work that we are doing in, uh, uh, in our group. And uh, the, the, you know, the papers that we have submitted in some of the leading conferences. So uh, with that, uh, you know, with that overview, uh, I wanted to really get into some specifics, you know, as a research scientist, um, you know, what, uh, you are doing. So the specific question I have for you is, uh, what are the functional areas or sometimes people call them as domains? Uh, in Intel, uh, in which are the functional areas you have applied uh, AI techniques? Uh, you know, since you have been with AI CYE for uh, quite a number of years and how similar are they? Uh, can you, you know, kind of give a glimpse about a glimpse of it and can you elaborate it a bit? Sure, Gopan. I think that's an excellent question. So one thing, the short answer is that there is not a single domain that uh, that will uh, emphasize everything that we do at Intel. So for example, my journey at Intel started in the infrastructure analytics domain. So we, uh, I started learning the service management model of Intel, uh, the vast computing infrastructure that Intel IT maintains in-house. And uh, the initial charter that I was dealing with was applying ML to the ML, uh, the problems that we have there. So we ended up building things like a preventive maintenance uh, model for our critical infrastructure devices. Uh, we created a, a data aggregation pipeline from scratch for all of those devices and realized that there is a need for a, a very generic anomaly detection so that it, it can be applied to all the devices data without a lot of retweaking and redeveloping. So we created that uh, anomaly detection model and that still runs without uh, any hiccups. It's just a configuration-based system. If you have a system you want to monitor, uh, you can just put it in, change some configuration, and you are up to go. So, um, so that was the initial uh, thing that I was involved in. Uh, the second domain that I worked extensively was in the supply chain domain, especially the, uh, the sourcing side of supply chain. So one thing we have to understand about intense supply chain is that is uh, that, that it is very, complex it's not an easy task even just sourcing the products uh, that we need for our uh, semiconductor development is uh, huge so what we did uh, what i did initially there was build a a, a very uh, generic com uh, supplier and competitor ecosystem sensing system and what we were trying to do there was we were trying to understand what is happening with our suppliers how we can evaluate our suppliers uh, which are good for us so that we can use those uh, uh, use that data to uh, get a better deal with them or get better initial um, integration with them so these kind of things i did in supply chain domain uh, at the same time uh, another aspect of the same system was that we were sensing our competitors ecosystem like what they are doing uh, can we can we get an early alert for uh, uh, something that they are pursuing which we are not pursuing things like that so another another problem that I worked in the supply chain domain entirely different from the same one was um, 
um, on the surface quite simple that can we use our um, past pur purchase data to provide uh, good estimates for starting price negotiation to our commodity managers but the challenge involved there was more on the data side that you have to do a lot of uh, uh, intelligent data management uh, you have to create a lot of features on the base data itself so that you get the maximum information out of that data so so that was supply chain infrastructure the next domain uh, truly in intel fashion was entirely different so i was working with the our nsg team which is basically the team that manufactured our ssds and the problem that we were trying to solve there was that can we integrate the manufacturing data for our ssds with the production data that our customer is uh, getting um, at, at uh, doing the monitoring at runtime and can we integrate those two to uh, come up with a better system for a predictive uh, so, uh, their predictive failures so that is the work that i did there again then the next domain again entirely different so i worked in the validation space of semi semiconductor manufacturing i we were working with the uh, simulation validation data from our uh, validation team and what we were trying to do there was that we were trying to look at the sequence data that our validation test generates and see if there is a pattern that is occurring and uh, then use uh, cutting edge technologies like variational inference auto encoders and gan to generate synthetic tests which will help us in breaking those uh, uh, breaking those uh, uh, patterns and generate intelligent corner cases so the recent very recent work that i am doing is again um, at the surface quite simple i'm trying to come up with a recommendation recommendation uh, system which will help our employees at our fabs fabs are basically the um, the manufacturing facilities where we manufacture semiconductors uh, so that they can have a better uh, uh, le uh, learning path for themselves but this is again just a initial foray into this field and i um, i uh, like foresee a number of challenging use cases coming from the fab space in the future so to sum it up um, personally, I find the diversity of domains interesting. Um, and the true, uh, the tough part there is that it makes domain understanding part of my job quite challenging. But the fulfillment to develop, uh, delve in different dom business domain and connect them to the common theme of data-driven solution is what mo motivates me and ensure that there is never a dull moment while you are an AI research scientist at Intel. So, so again, <laughs> and and if you go to my colleagues. Probably they will. You you will have a bigger list, and if you compile them all, uh, <laughs> it will more resemble a whole consulting space rather than just one. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tushar. I think uh, uh, truly a diverse experience uh, from a domain point of view, as well as in applying the AI techniques, right? Um, uh, right from recommender systems to you know anomaly detection. I think you have touched um, uh, every part of uh, the classical ML algorithms, all you know, uh, as part of your uh, career in uh, as a data scientist and research scientist in uh, AICOE. With that, um, uh, I will move to uh, Sakina. Sakina, I had a question for you, which is um, uh, you have been uh, with AICOE for about uh, three years now. Having uh, worked as a data scientist in other firms um, uh, before joining Intel AICOE, uh, what is the difference you see in your role as a, uh, as a research scientist in Intel AI uh, group? Um. Yeah, so uh, I have worked on uh, multiple machine learning projects earlier in other two companies. And uh, one of the major differences that I see here as, a, as an AI applied research scientist is um, here we uh, not only uh, solve problems that are directly provided to us by the business, but we also ideate with the business to and understand their business problems and come up with use cases that can be solvable using AI. So, um, uh, and another thing is, um, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, this is one uh, interesting thing because this uh, we do uh, with the help of ideation sessions. So uh, we conduct ideations, ideation sessions where we uh, discuss ideas and uh, brainstorm on these ideas and assess whether these ideas uh, can be solvable uh, using uh, AI. So uh, another interesting thing is like uh, since semiconductor domain itself is a, a complex one, so uh, we spend a lot of time and we 
uh, spend good amount of time in uh, understanding the business domain so uh, this helps us in formulating the problem better so since i think formulation is one of the important aspects in any uh, data science process so um, uh, so i think that is the most complex and uh, uh, the most challenging one as well so and uh, another uh, reason why we uh, spend a lot of time in understanding the business domain and the business process is that we uh, it helps us in uh, identifying the relevant data for the use case so uh, sometimes the business uh, themselves provide us the uh, the data uh, initially but then we also uh, 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 like we propose some additional data elements that can be uh, helpful for our uh, use cases and that can uh, be impactful features for our model so that is based on our business understanding so uh, and once we have uh, gained a good business understanding we um, uh, like but uh, we uh, spend time in designing our solution so that is where we uh, brainstorm on different techniques like uh, what techniques uh, technique best suits our use case whether it should be a simple classical ml based approach or a deep learning based approach or should we uh, uh, go even for advanced techniques uh, to solve the business uh, problems so, um, so that is one interesting aspect since uh, 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 so we uh, uh, so we not only like uh, uh, focus on uh, one simple classical approach but we also uh, dive into different approaches that can be used to solve a problem and we don't do not restrict ourselves to just uh, uh, direct application of these algorithms we sometimes even tweak these algorithms to better suit our use case and um, another uh, in, another interesting thing is that we also uh, encourage a lot for participation in external conferences uh, through uh, tutorial uh, presentations or uh, paper submissions so uh, if we find any work that is uh, innovative and interesting so we also we encourage to um, uh, submit those papers in different uh, top conferences so, uh, uh, you, yeah, so you, that, you got one uh, best tutorial award, right? Which conference was that? Yeah, uh, so recently I uh, participated in this IEEE Ventecon conference, so uh, we, where we presented a tutorial on awesome. uh, 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 information retrieval from tabular data in advanced QA system. So, uh, we received the best uh, tutorial award there. Impressive. So, yeah. So these are some of the activities that uh, keeps us motivated and excites us to be a part of this uh, team and to be in this role. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Sakina. I think you really uh, brought out uh, some important things, right? Like mm -hmm. spending more time in formulation of the problem because problem well-defined is 50% solved. And then the effort we put in brainstorming and coming up with the right algorithmic approach. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think these are some uh, interesting aspects or facets of data science life cycle, right? Uh, that we do because nobody bakes a problem and gives us. Uh, so we have to go uh, identify the problem using ideation workshops and then bake them and finally deliver them. Uh, thank you. That was a good summary. So with that, uh, I will uh, move to Divya. Uh, Divya, uh, uh, you have been, um, you know, uh, uh, presenting papers, you know, like Sakina, you have also been presenting papers in external conferences and even quite a lot of uh, conferences within Intel. So the question I have for you is, uh, can you, you know, give a quick uh, idea of what are some of the exciting problems that you have solved uh, using AI, you know, because um, you almost have a pretty good hit rate of whichever problem you solve finally became a paper. So wanted to kind of, uh, you know, get an idea of uh, the problems that you have solved, uh, you know, not in the last level of detail, but, you know, a quick overview. Yeah. Thank you, Gopalin. So uh, I think Tushar covered a lot of variety of uh, problems from uh, different types of domains. Uh, but uh, I'll, uh, I got an opportunity to work on the um, uh, chip design and uh, the core chip design and validation process. Uh, like um, So 
the complete process itself is very complicated so at every phase of that process there is something that can be optimized so there are still many processes which are either uh, highly iterative or uh, still require a lot of manual effort so i got an opportunity to work on um, uh, multiple such uh, use cases so one of the um, uh, one of the interesting use cases i worked on was uh, to accelerate the timing convergence of this uh, these chip designs so uh, basically timing convergence is one of the major phase of uh, the design process wherein we have to remove all the timing violations in the design now uh, many of you might be thinking like we have eda tools and so many uh, different tools that uh, for this purpose but even after the eda tools uh, do a good job of removing these violations there are still many violations that have to be removed manually or handled manually so uh, we uh, found like uh, there is a potential to reduce that manual effort and we also found that uh, this timing convergence um, process was also very highly iterative and um, uh, so basically in this process we had uh, uh, given a clock tree uh, we had to uh, recommend buffers that have to be added to this clock tree so that the timing viol violations in the design can be reduced so uh, uh, so uh, at a high level you can think like we have a tree data structure and we have to insert some nodes in this tree data structure so um, one of the ways that we uh, solved the problem was to convert this into an optimization problem and uh, you may think that uh, ai uh, is mostly classical ml or deep learning but even if you are able to solve something with as simple as an optimization uh, problem even that is good so uh, in our team we brainstorm on different approaches and finally we found that this was suiting best for this uh, problem so this was one type of problem that we handled um, another interesting problem was in the design emulation so what we mean by emulation is we take the software chip design and we have to map it to some uh, say hardware like um, multiple fpgas so um, on a high level you can think you have a a design which can which is actually graph uh, which uh, actually a graph and we have to partition that design and map it to the hardware so um, again this was a very different problem like uh, early, uh, it couldn't directly be solved by classical ml uh, techniques or optimization techniques so we uh, because it was a graph we used graph neural networks to extract information from the design structure and use that to finally partition the data um, uh, so uh, these are just some uh, two of the use cases that uh, we solved and you can see like uh, the variety of approaches we take for uh, these different problems and uh, so apart from these deep learning or optimization techniques like Tushar also mentioned we have recommendation systems or classical ML techniques so we end up um, handling uh, the different domains and different problem statements using a variety of AI algorithms and I think since AI is an exponentially growing field uh, this is something I really enjoy doing, uh, staying up to date with these techniques and trying to see how we can um, solve these uh, complex problems. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I know, you know, the trials and tribulations we went through when the Minkat algorithm really didn't help us to scale the complexity, scale along with the complexity, right? So the kind of research that we did to finally come up with the graph convolution neural nets and the optimization that we added to the loss function yeah amazing work so thank you very much uh, divya so uh, we will go to the last panelist uh, mr ravi shankar uh, he is the machine learning engineer who leads uh, the machine learning um, uh, competency within ai center of excellence so uh, ravi uh, give us a quick idea about um, you know the typical role of a machine learning engineer in um, uh, AI Center of Excellence, what are the various tools, platforms that you use, and uh, what is that you find as uh, something exciting in your role as a machine learning engineer? Yeah. <clears throat> sure, Gopal. So I'll answer all the three questions that you asked, but it's, I'll yeah, go one by question. one. <laughs> so yeah, I'll go one by one. So the first one is, uh, what is the typical role of a machine learning engineer in AI Center of Excellence, right? So to answer the question, the role of an MLE in a center of excellence predominantly has like two activities i'd say and the first one 
but most uh, more obvious one is as a machine learning engineer i own deploying the models developed by these data scientists into production and here the deployment is not simply exposing the exposing the machine learning model as a rest endpoint by deployment i mean the entire inference graph the pre processing steps and the model and the post processing steps that the data scientists usually use so <clears throat> deploying all these as an inference graph with unit and integration tests and in an automated way to the production environment as well as maintaining this model in the production environment by using monitoring and logging all the inputs and the model performance over the time so that as machine learning models the performance degrades over the time so these monitoring and logging tools help us to trigger if any retraining is required so that encompasses the entire deployment and this entire process is typically referred to as ml ops which is the combination of machine learning and devops practice which is uh, borrowed from the software engineering practice okay and <clears throat> the second activity that uh, an mle uh, actively takes takes part in is building uh, building the libraries packages and the workflow management systems on top of kubernetes for um, for data scientists with collaboration with data science teams and it operation teams so that the end users and data scientists can easily interact with the infrastructure without worrying about the underlying details where mle takes <coughs> care of the underlying details so that sums up the role of a machine learning engineer and to fulfill this role we use many of the open source tools and platforms and that is regarding the second question where what are the tools and platforms that we use so in terms of platforms we use predominantly kubernetes and uh, within intel we are offering kubeflow as well and coming to the uh, open source tools we use um, a plethora of open source tools starting with mlflow which is used to tra track the machine learning experiments and log the best models to a central model registry where the model can be used by downstream applications okay and the second one being ci cd automation tools like jenkins which is used to automate the entire deployment process and the third one being selden core which is used to package the ml model and expose the rest api endpoints and the third one being monitoring and logging tools like grafana and kibana and elastic search for storing the logs and minio as a backend storage and elast alert for alerting the users about the model performance and the entire cacd pipelines uh, execution status so on top of using this open source tools the mle the mle uh, i also do the in house customization of these tools to fit our purposes so that's regarding the entire uh, tools and uh, platforms and the last the important question like what is it that i find exciting in my in my role so as an mle i take pride in the fact that the work i do enables these data scientists to de develop the models fast and easily and by enabling and streamlining the entire deployment process we enable the machine learning models to deliver the value that they are designed for so i take pride in that yeah awesome yeah quite a comprehensive overview of uh, a machine learning engineer role in the aicoe thank you very much uh, ravi uh, sajithi with this uh, with that uh, you know we can move into the questions if there are any questions from the participants yes we do have a lot of questions that have lined up now uh i'll quickly go through them so um let's uh, go to the first question uh, this is uh, okay it seems anonymous is exposure to semiconductor design a prerequisite to become a data scientist in intel oh great question so i'll first take a stab at it and then um, uh, and then uh, uh, ask my panelists also to uh, you know uh, talk about it. Uh, first and foremost is um, uh, all we look for is an engineering mindset. Uh, so 
uh, it is not that um, in fact uh, i when i before joining intel i had no clue of semiconductor design right so like tushar mentioned in his uh, uh, response to the question also he has worked in different domains uh, within intel and he said that is the challenge and the exciting piece of uh, working in a horizontal organization like AA Center of Excellence, which is quickly ramping up in a domain and then solving the problem, right? You're not alone in this journey. You know, when you're talking about a complex semiconductor design problem or a validation problem, you're not alone. Typically, the way our execution model is we pair the data scientist with a subject matter expert or a group of subject matter experts work with the data scientist. So they complement you. Uh, you bring the data science skills to the table. They complement you with their um, domain expertise. That is one way. In addition, you also still need to speak their language, understand their pain points, right? So all we expect is an engineering mindset to quickly understand what they are talking about. So, uh, you know, an ability to quickly learn and ramp up uh, in the domain is enough. You know, we are not really looking for DLSI uh, experience or something like that. Um, because in our team, we have seen people who, uh, you know, like me, I am a mechanical engineer. So, uh, you know, people, uh, data scientists who don't even have either an undergrad or a master specialization in electronics and communication, also not just uh, you know they not only survive but they thrive in this role so all we look for is um, an engineering mindset and a, and a, a passion to learn any domain right that should help them to kind of do a fantastic job in a central uh, to add to that point uh, just one thing that uh, you will not need the skill beforehand but what you will need is uh, uh, the desire to ramp up because that will be uh, critical because uh, uh, there will be times, uh, especially in the initial meetings, I think all of us have experienced that we can't, uh, basically first meeting, it's more about understanding what they are talking about. Because sometimes uh, when you work in an organization as complex as Intel, even the lingo is something that <laughs> takes some time getting used to. So uh, so you will not need ex uh, the same uh, semiconductor skills. Probably it's a good thing because we don't, uh, we encourage, uh, that will encourage you not to pigeonhole into the semiconductor talk. You can still uh, work from the uh, the DS side of things, the ML side of things. But at the same time, uh, once you spend some time in the domain, you should be able to talk like that. You should be able to understand what is going on. You should be able to, uh, like you should feel confident enough to challenge an expert, uh, ask a incisive question to them. So that is the skill that is more required probably the more human side of uh, uh, data scientists and uh, ml uh, practitioners which sometimes is lost in all the um, all the in, in the executions that we do so that would be very much required for you thank you thanks to yeah to summarize um, yeah engineering mindset with you know learning uh, a passion to learn should help you settle down in the road yeah right. i so hope this think... answers the question uh okay let's uh, go to the next one so amit is asking would like to know what is pi primarily used for building ai models and how these models are deployed as they are embedded models in most cases uh well uh, not all of them are embedded models you know i think probably amit is referring to embedded model means uh, will the model sit in the core cpu or the gpu that we are designing right not all of them but we do have uh, one of the verticals in IT's artificial intelligence group, which focuses on uh, hardware architecture. Uh, you know, uh, if there are, I'm sure there are some white papers on this in IT at Intel. I would request Amit to go and take a look at it. So the only thing I'll say is um, a, the response is yes and no. Not all the solutions that we put are embedded in nature. There, there are many which are, you know, going into enabling the process you know not really getting into the product itself you know but just enabling the process so that's how it is and in terms of development it is pretty much you know uh, python based work correct okay i hope amit this helps uh, the next question is from ashitosh uh, what is or are are the most challenging aspects of implementing pocs into production given that Intel already would have some pipelines in place. Uh, okay, Ravi, do you want to handle that? Or yeah, sure. Challenges in so, uh, implementing production, uh, maybe others can. So, yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So um, given the Intel's um, wide range of organizations, right? So there is uh, no one solution that fits all the uh, different organizations. If you take uh, manufacturing and sales and marketing teams, they are completely different and their requirements are different and the type of models that they develop and um, deploy into production is different. But um, as a machine learning engineering team, um, IT AI in general, what uh, we have done is we have standardized the production environment, which is uh, based on Kubernetes, where users can develop and use the tools that they need. So we have um, offered the tools as a self-service mode. So we have customized all the tools so that user need not to worry about the implementation details and they can use, um, so we have offered many tools like uh, data sourcing tools and then uh, model building tools and uh, the <clears throat> CICD pipeline tools. So users can actually take advantage of these and customize them to their requirement. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, um, uh, can you give us an idea of uh, Intel's AI center of excellence hiring process? Oh, okay. It is, uh, to be honest with you, it's a pretty grueling process. Um, for first and foremost is an algorithmic round. Um, you know, essentially, uh, we are looking for people with uh, very strong programming skills. So, you know, you can pick a language of your choice. You know, uh, of course, end of the day, you will be coding in Python, whether you are a data scientist or a machine learning engineer. But, you know, here you have the flexibility to solve the algorithmic problem using any of the programming language. You know, we have uh, had, um, we have hired data scientists who have solved them. Um, problems using JavaScript and C sharp, you know, absolutely language is not a constraint, but you have to clear the algorithmic round. Then the second round is the data science round. You know, if you are a data scientist, machine learning engineers will go through a separate track. Uh, for data scientists, you have to clear the second round, which is a, a data science uh, specific round. Um, uh, there could be some small case studies on, also in that. So we present a problem, a business problem to you, and then uh, ask you to solve the problem. Uh, you know, in real time with us. Uh, and then the third and fourth rounds are fundamentally understanding your personality more and then um, uh, and then figuring out what your interests are and what are the things that you do beyond your job. Uh, we want to understand your entire personality. And then, you know, we try to understand the, you know, how good you'll be fitting into the culture of uh, AI Center of Excellence and IT AI. Uh, broadly, these are the stages a candidate goes through. Got it. Okay, I hope this crueling process <laughs> sort of works out for uh, the people who wants to, uh, you know, join in. Um, okay, uh, I have one more question from Ashutosh. He's asking, what are some key points to take care of when, when I want to start incorporating machine learning and artificial intelligence into already functioning critical pipelines? Uh, I think uh, it's a fairly generic question, not very specific to Intel. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll be <laughs> I'll be doing a, a, a talk in uh, the upcoming. Uh, Global Data Science Summit. I would request Ashutosh to sign up for the session. I'm going to talk about um, how do you execute AI projects in a disciplined way. So he will get an idea of how to do that. Since we are running out of time, you know, I'm uh, really torn in responding to you by saying that attend the other talk. But you know, I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to keep all the participants waiting. So please join the uh, my talk on uh, in the Global Data Science Summit on executing data science project with this. So it will give you an idea. Got it. So, okay. Uh, Venkata Ramana is asking uh, if uh, AI COE is in Malaysia. He is from a Malaysian startup. Uh, so at this you... point, uh, we don't have. At this point, we don't have. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shiva is asking, uh, hi all, how should I get started with career opportunities in machine learning and deep learning space in semiconductor domain? Uh, given I have other domain experience. Uh, I would request uh, him to approach me, you know, DM me in LinkedIn. I would be very happy to talk to him. Yeah, for any of the questions, in fact, we would not be able to reach out or if any of these uh, career-related questions related to 
you know intel's ai ceo please reach out to mr gopal and i am sure he would be happy to help you guys okay yeah, uh, yeah. yeah correct uh, what is the process of undertaking business domain i think this was related to sakina's uh, point when she mentioned that you know uh you know she took a lot of time to understand these business domain and what is the approach one should take to understand uh business domain specifically simple put effort <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah yeah uh, no gain uh, you know without pain so you have okay. to burn some calories to understand the domain um so there is no easy way for that Correct. Absolutely right. Okay. And, and, uh, uh, one thing on that can help is that if you can find a mentor in that space, if you are looking for supply chain experience, look for someone who works in that. Uh, if you want uh, some exposure to semiconductor domain, look for someone who is doing hardware verification, hardware development. Uh, that they will like your. You can do your own effort, but tap them in uh, as much as you can because that will be that insider's perspective is uh, pretty much required. Thank yeah. you, Tushar. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that experience comes only by working on those kind of problems. So while working on those problems, like deep dive along with the domain experts, and I think that's the only way to ramp up. Yeah, yeah. The best way to learn something is to jump into the pool. <laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, very nicely pointed out. Okay. Uh, Faryal is asking. Uh, Hi, I see Intel is involved in. very different and vast projects so my question is what breakthrough does intel plans to bring in in the field of artificial intelligence <laughs> uh see our breakthroughs will be you know we are fundamentally uh, developing ai solution to run intel on ai when you are talking about breakthrough probably is referring to breakthrough products that intel will bring um you know he has to just stay tuned to intel newsroom you know you will uh, you know uh, you will see already you know you, we have started uh, releasing some exciting ai products both in the training space as well as in the inference space yeah continue to keep uh, watching uh, watch out for the newsroom intel newsroom updates you will see exciting ai products coming from intel they have already started coming so they will continue to come got it okay um Jawar is asking um, could you please elaborate more on some use cases of ai for chip design uh there are few we have covered i would humbly request uh, jawar to go and look at it at intel uh, this website has got a ton of material use cases by verticals you know that have been solved uh, not just by intel even by our partners and then and, and by our fellow travelers in the ecosystem uh, I, I, you know uh, that will be a good starting point to look at the use cases get it absolutely okay there is one question for uh, ravi um, uh, tamila rasi is asking can you please uh, tell the tools once again oh okay you are ready with the pen <laughs> yeah, sure. he will start. <laughs> so um there are many actually uh, i have listed um some of them so i'll just go through the list once again for your reference so ml flow jenkins selden core grafana kibana elastic search elast alert and minio ravi you were a bit fast i don't know whether yeah, the how to say hope you are making the notes <laughs> oh i'm sorry okay so Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Just uh, let her, um, you know, uh, ping me in LinkedIn. I can share the details. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's I. But I hope Tamirasi, you got a uh, hang of what 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 sort of tools that he are he's mentioning right now. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, I have a question from Amit. Uh, what tools? Okay. Are used for ML ops? Any cloud that Intel uses? Okay. Yeah. Not so sure. I can take the question. so as of now um we have on prem kubernetes clusters and we are also using uh clusters from aws and azure as well but for most of the intel top secret data or intel confidential data we use only um on prem um infrastructure yep okay 
Great. Uh, Amit is also asking, uh, did Intel provide, uh, does Intel provide any learning module which is helpful in career building at Intel or that can be helpful in AI and ML learning? Uh, with, uh, not really, you know, you may not find um, another web page in Intel which will tell you how to, you know, build an AI career in Intel. These kind of webinars, you know, we will be launching series of webinars in the coming quarters. So stay tuned to it, you know, we will get into specifics of, uh, you know, how to build an AI career in Intel. Excellent question. And uh, it also puts uh, uh, the onus on us to continue to educate the ecosystem on what we are doing, how can you build a career in AI specifically in Intel. We will continue to do that. This is the first step we are taking. Correct. Okay. Um, for the next question, uh, Fargi is asking, uh, how can we introduce machine learning techniques in modeling semiconductor devices using uh, C, uh, TCAD uh, software? Uh, sorry, what was the second? Uh, using uh, TCAD software. I don't know. I know only CAD. The, uh, Divya. I think I think the, she she wanted to mention CAD. I think it could be a typo. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think most of uh, the CAD tools they handle a huge uh, portion of the complete design and validation process. So AI can play a part in any of these processes. So uh, whichever part you think is taking a lot of time or can be automated or uh, you want to reduce the dependence on expert engineers or some um, uh, or uh, you want to reduce the number of iterations and so on. So um, uh, I think it doesn't really matter uh, on the tool. Uh, so I, uh, if you're using some processes like uh, you can use AI in any of the processes um, if uh, that uh, can be solved by AI like uh, I think that is the first question to see like whether even AI is required or not but if it is required then uh, it is not that much dependent on the tools if it is uh, the processes correct um, I hope that answers the question um... Okay, uh, Vikram is asking, uh, though one of the slides talks about the compliance issues, what regulations does Intel applies or follows or recommends depending on the solutions offered? Essentially, when we, yeah, I think he's referring to the center of the four services that uh, a, a you know a everywhere organization offers yeah. uh, it is around governance when we say it is uh, uh, governance and compliance when we say it is around uh, explainable ai responsible ai you know those kind of aspects we look at and then we look at features uh, you know that can bias an algorithm those are the facts uh, factors that we consider when we review an algorithm uh, before we put it into production that's what we look at purely from um, uh, governance and compliance perspective, uh, uh, both responsible and explainable. You know, these are the two aspects we check. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. There is one career-related question from Krishna Vini. Uh, uh, she's asking, I have learned data science. Is there any opportunity for any sort of entry-level jobs? Uh, I think uh, there is going to be a link uh, sent out uh, to the participants on the current openings that are there in uh, IT AI group uh, continue to watch out you know because um, we are on a rapid path of expansion so you know uh, continue to look for opportunities we do have uh, you know we do encourage intern openings you know interns if she's talking about an entry level internship is the one uh, way she can look at it but I don't know whether she's an experienced professional or a college grad uh, so internship is one opportunity by which uh, you know Intel brings in fresh talent fresh perspective into our mainstream operations um, uh, and um, you know keep looking for research scientists machine learning engineer roles uh, in intel you know that should be the you know and then try to go through the hiring process correct correct okay uh, i have a question from Sriyash. uh he's asking for the solutions developed at intel to solve the problems and the use cases that were discussed what was the composition of the solutions developed that involved building of AI algorithms from scratch? 
are all solutions developed from scratch or do they incorporate uh, other available open source models or parts of it uh, not sure what he means by from scratch right if i bring a scikit-learn library is that from scratch or is he expecting that i will develop a library you know in and contribute to scikit-learn or do something similar to that i'm not sure but to answer his response it is a hybrid approach right? it's a combination yeah okay. i think it depends on the use case also if some uh, already existing algorithms can solve it then we'll go ahead and use it if uh, some new development is required then we'll do that us uh, we also do uh, a judicious combination of uh, not really ensemble techniques but applying optimization techniques with uh, deep learning techniques you know variety of approaches we take that's where um, the research effort comes in yeah. And um, to add to it, Divya's answer, I think it's a call you take on the use case basis. Uh, sometime, uh, sometime your majority of work is not in the solution development, but in the data augmentation part. So their classical ML algorithm will work out. Sometime it's more about, uh, you know, a solution that is a good fit, but uh, you need to do some part on the data uh, so that you make, make that fit uh, better, uh, make that fit better. Uh, sometimes you you can end up uh, changing things in the algorithm itself like uh, there were the use cases that they were extend uh, shared right so we did a lot of modification in there uh, which were not traditional which were not out of the package but again so uh, the gist of it is it depends on uh, how you want to solve it and what's the best way to solve the problem you have okay um okay um I have another career related question. Uh, Shravani is asking, uh, as an entry level computer vision engineer, what specific technical skills will make a profile stand out? Projects, projects, projects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I so hope. Oh, it may yeah. sound like a catch 22 situation where she will say, hey, I'm an entry level engineer. How will I get okay. projects, right? Um, there are plenty of opportunities. You have to keep your eyes and ears open. You know, there are a lot of uh, government-sponsored projects, hackathons, which are looking for you know um, folks like Shravani, you know, strong computer vision engineers. These are great opportunities to exercise your skills and build a very strong resume. So we do look for people with such uh, you know who have demonstrated such initiative. You know, not um, really looking for a tangible. Uh, return, but contributing it, uh, contributing for such a cause so that they can develop their skills, right? The return in this case is improvement in their skills. We look for such people who have taken up such initiatives, you know, hackathons that are organized by uh, state governments, central governments, by NASCOM, you know, plenty of opportunities around. Please look out for it. And then um, that's where you can apply your skills and develop your develop a very strong. Good. Okay, um, another career related question. Madhumita is asking, uh, being a semiconductor science and being from a semiconductor and science and technology background, really want to contribute something to data driven modeling uh, in devices to circuits, data driven modeling in devices to circuits in Intel like brands, can it be possible and how to be? Uh, Pusha, anybody from the panel? Uh, so if I understand the question, like it's about finding AI's uh, um, opportunities in chip design. So okay. I think, uh, yeah, so mostly uh, it's about uh, just, uh, so I think basic exposure to AI techniques will help here. So I think if somebody is from a semiconductor or electronics background, uh, doing some basic courses in AI, like uh, basic machine learning or deep learning courses will at least give um some idea as to where we can apply these techniques like in their domain so i think that could be a good starting point because they are in their domain so they know which problems need to be solved and once they get some basic ex exposure to ai tools and techniques and algorithms they can match accordingly like is it a good um, uh, use of uh, ai for their problem correct 
Oh, thanks, Divishri. Uh, okay, going to the next question. Uh, this is from Shomya Deep. Um, he's asking, would the Intel uh, AI Center of Excellence value senior product leaders from the software do domain uh, who have a background in AI ML and handle analytics projects, but in analytics analytics domain? Uh, so actually, yes, um, uh, because we are, as Gopal mentioned, we are in an expansions phase, and that is this is one of the um, uh, one of the domain that we are trying to in, uh, inculcate into our group. That uh, how can we have some uh, this, uh, a product owner or a product manager kind of a role who can work with different domain and uh, and grow our business essentially because uh, till now what we have been doing is as as data scientists have been uh, taking that responsibility but uh, i think we have reached a stage where we want dedicated professional to, to do that rather than uh, our data scientists uh, doing the dual role so definitely there is scope for it because um, it, it's a it's a like it's a it's a synergy of these two things we have to work out but if you have exposure in both uh, product own, uh, product ownership and product manager kind of a role, and you have exposure to analytics, I think that is a, a very good uh, skill that we like to have. Okay, great. Uh, well, there are more questions. Uh, however, in the interest of time, we would not be able to take them up all here. But as uh, Mr. Gopalan has said, uh, if there are any questions related to the industry or to making a career in Gopalan, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. Uh, I think your audio, are you guys having issues? With audio? Uh, I'm not sure. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, we sort of lost okay. Gopalan here. Maybe my net. Go ahead, uh, CJ. Okay, great. So, as I was telling, there were a lot of questions, but we would not be able to take all of them in the interest of time. But please do reach out to Mr. Gopalan. As Ravi said, Ravi would also be happy to help. Divya Shri, Tushar, Sakina. Please reach out to them on LinkedIn and they'll be happy to take up these questions. However, the session was amazing and I hope the audience had a good understanding of the uh, multiplex complications in the chip development and uh, how effectively artificial intelligence can be used to solve these problems and how Intel uh, AI Center of Excellence is playing a role in it. It was amazing to hear the experiences from the panel. So thank you once again to all of you guys and thanks Mr. Gopalan. It was great to have you guys here. Thank you, everyone. You know, uh, first of all, uh, to all the participants and Sajithi and the panelists, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a great day. Evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.